work. Yeah, I just have to turn off the transcript because that is always very awkward. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> No worries. So um, with that introduction, uh, uh, Tim, I would like to uh, to give you the floor, and I'm really um, uh, anxious to hear more about your about your uh, ideas. Great. Thank you very much, Rene. Um, I will share my screen uh, first to get that out of the way. I hope it's visible. It is. It's not in presentation Great. mode yet, but yeah, now it is. I think now yeah. it should be. Yeah, yes, um, it is. no, Renee, thanks. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Uh, you're absolutely right. I think that's uh, definitely one of the challenges uh, for Biosphere as well as as a company, of course, um, because now with the whole energy transition underway, uh, there is so much energy uh, <laughs> metaphorically being put into the process that uh, it's um, hard to also uh, look one step further. Um, but that is what Biosphere is doing. Um, my name is Tim Kasjager, like uh, Rene said, and uh, I'm one of the co-founders, head of product development mainly. And most public speaking I do, therefore, is, is for investors and dragons dens, and you know, I need to pitch a story that can withstand these, uh, these dragons. Um, and uh, we'll tell them that we have the best idea ever, uh, but now I'm surrounded by sharp uh, and academic individuals. Uh, so uh, yeah, I think that um, I will also try and flip the classroom a little bit and be able to discuss and have, uh, have a fruitful discussion, uh, more, than, uh, more than trying to convince you that we have, uh, have the answer. <laughs> Uh, so just a quick summary, uh, we're Biosphere um, and we um, are developing a solar panel, redesigning it so that it enables uh, circular flows at the end of life, uh, but also extending the lifetime. We've currently raised about 40,000 in funding, um, done several iterations on the prototype, and we are in, uh, yeah, we've participated in, uh, in an accelerator in Wuppertal for circularity. Um, but besides this product, besides the, um, uh, the concept of a modular solar panel, Biosphere also is a company that wants to tell a story, uh, a story of worry and a story of hope for the future. And we let ourselves be inspired by science, but also by the solar punk movement. And the solar punk movement is a political and aesthetic movement that tries to imagine a technology driven, but also nature and human oriented future. So Googling uh, solar punk will, will give you some of these beautiful images, but also show that it is embedded in a social political conviction for the future. Um, more concretely, we have as a mission statement to bring fairness and circularity um, to the solar market and industry. Fairness, of course, being uh, at least transparency and knowing where products and materials come from. So let's state uh, or sketch the state of the solar deployment today. Um, I mean, in the ambitious case, 10 terawatts of cumulative PV will be deployed worldwide by 2030. And NG and Energy Corporation mentioned that uh, uh, one terawatt per year is set to be deployed from 2030. So if it's not exactly 2030, it will be somewhere soon. Um, and this, of course, has its dark twin, and that is the PV waste that we will be generating down the line. 10 terawatts of current technology means 550 million tons of solar panels. So what kind of consequences does this have for raw material um, and uh, toxicity for uh, the climate? So our panel um, will not be using the chemical components that are being used in uh, 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 Asian manufactured solar panels uh, currently. Um, therefore, we haven't quite researched the numbers for this. Um, but for example, antimony, we know, uh, binds itself to the tin in um, the recycling process of glass, and that makes it impossible to recycle glass that has antimony in it, which is used in Chinese uh, and um, Asian manufactured solar panels to improve the transparency. Um, PFAS has already been uh, an alarming uh, problem for the um, Dutch uh, Institute for uh, Healthcare uh, and the Environment. Um, the numbers are already uh, alarmingly high and lead is used for soldering in uh, almost all solar panels currently and has obvious health hazards. Um, for the other side of things, not only the danger, but also the, the, the missed opportunities for all these valuable materials for our, our circular economy, um, let's look at some numbers that we would need. Uh, so silicon, high-grade silicon, silver, copper, and tin are some uh, uh, materials that we will definitely be needing uh, in the energy transition. Uh, and for silicon, the high-grade silicon that we need for solar panels and most electronics are derived from quartz. 
of which you need about two and a half times the amounts uh, in order to get uh, the silicon that you need. 85% uh, is lost in cell cutting and other processes, which leaves us at about um, 68 million tons of high-grade uh, quartz for this uh, for for this transition. Silver uh, means that uh, it's only 0.1% of the weight, uh, but that still re uh, yeah results in 560,000 uh, tons of silver, which puts some which is a significant number if you look at the general reserves for silver. Um, Copper is about seven and a half percent of the um, uh, of the weight, including. So this is deduced from the entire uh, solar installment. Um, so that also includes the cabling, the inverters, everything. Um, and we calculated that for that we would need about forty one million uh, tons of copper. And since yearly yearly copper mining uh, stands at about twenty million tons, this says something about the amount of strain we'll be putting on this uh, um, this extraction. Tin is, uh, is less significant, but still worth mentioning that uh, we will be needing uh, hundreds of thousands of tons of tin as well. Now, what are we developing to try and extend the lifetime uh, and make the uh, circular economy uh, yeah, more um, ready for solar deployment? Currently, all solar panels or most solar panels are being laminated together with an EVA lamination. Uh, this makes it um, impossible to repair uh, and very hard to recycle. Um, you know, just and just like Patagonia also markets their products by saying, do not buy this. Uh, Biosphere also wants the world to need less solar panels. And that's why um, we want to extend this lifetime. Uh, that's something I, I wanted to mention. Uh, but to other manufacturers credit, there have been impressive developments uh, for uh, recycling lamination uh, or laminated panels. Uh, for example, there is there is a process now that does it at 80 degrees uh, in organic solvents, but uh, we prefer as Biosphere to design something that makes it uh, simpler to refurbish and recycle by design um, by omitting this layer. And that is why we use a PIB edge shield, much like uh, insulating glass units, um, uh, ensures that you get a good seal, um, but it prevents uh, or it makes uh, recycling and especially refurbishing easier. So that's what I'd like to show here. A lot of other companies, they they focus uh, on the recycling part as their circularity approach, uh, but we acknowledge that there are more R's uh, uh, as the uh, Ellen MacArthur um, uh, concept of uh, circularity suggests. So we have the reuse, we have refurbishing, and especially here, the biosphere panel uh, will be playing uh, a very important role. Um, in terms of the uh, the beachhead, so who would be uh, interested in a product like this? Um, uh, for our MVP, so our minimum viable product, we are looking at public-private organizations that are really willing to innovate with us. Um, so some interested customers are innovation hubs, um, uh, like ports and, uh, and such. Uh, we also have a confirmed um, a project with the municipality of The Hague, for example. Um, and uh, yeah, we uh, estimate that this beachhead in the Netherlands will be about 1.7 uh, million to start with. Um, and of course, the issue here is the current uh, value chain. So what I'd like to discuss is uh, what is the role of a circular product in a linear uh, supply chain? Uh, this is, of course, how it would look now. Uh, you have mineral extraction, you have uh, parts manufacturers, uh, you have us making the module, um, using it, for example, putting it on a building, um, then shredding it and uh, using it in, in some uh, downgraded uh, situation. Of course, in the first part, there are also um, the, the human rights issues with um, a lot of the supply chains for uh, solar cells, but also panels. Um, and the questionable end of life plans um, for this product. So what would Biosphere need to do to come here? Well, um, you know, it is uh, already quite a full-time job uh, as, as um, a startup to develop a product. Um, so what we are really looking for is uh, how to, as effectively as possible, um, discuss with the industry and with uh, all the stakeholders, how we make this uh, supply chain uh, circular together simultaneously. 
even if we wanted to make a panel that is refurbishable, we would still need to look into missing components such as uh, bodies that can do inspections, uh, bodies that can do the repairs, um, and also all of the legislation out here. So the confirmed project that we have with uh, the municipality of The Hague is going to uh, figure out just that. Are there any legislative barriers for um, taking solar panels back, repairing them, inspecting them? Does it still comply to all of the, the regulations that we have, et cetera? Um, so this is really where uh, our uh, challenge is um, outside of our scope. So my question, uh, and I'd like to make this a bit interactive, so let's uh, do a quick uh, Menti with everyone. Um, if you go to menti.com, you, uh, you can use the following code. Um, it should work. Um, my question is, uh, does it make sense to make a circular product in a circular economy? Um, so I'll give everyone two minutes. Um, and uh, I can't see everyone's faces, so I'm not sure if everyone is grabbing phones uh, and things right now, uh, or if it's... Uh, yeah, and if it if it works, um, but if you do go to this uh, website and fill in this code, you should be able to give uh, some kind of answer. <clears throat> of course, during the Q and A, there will be time to. Uh, <laughs> Explain your answer, so don't be afraid to uh, make it too conclusive. Well, yes and no. If uh, <clears throat> Rene or someone else could uh, confirm with me that uh, the answers are, are coming in, um, that would be great. Otherwise, I'm not we sure because I just sent an answer and, and uh, nothing's happening. OK. Yeah. Does uh, someone else have the same problem? Yeah, for me it's the same. I also responded, but uh, yeah, nothing is happening anything. on the screen, so maybe it's not. Okay. Yeah. It's just uh, we can also leave the question as a uh, <laughs> as some food for thoughts, and then uh, move move on in the Q and A. Um, let's see. Yeah, I am getting answers on uh, <laughs> on 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 my part. Um, so um, I will I will save these answers. Please please do answer. You can't you can't see them here unfortunately, but I will uh, pull them up uh, during the Q and A, and we can uh, we can discuss it. Right now the score is six for yes, zero for no, and seven for depends. So uh, I think that will be a fruitful discussion. Um, all right, then I will uh, move on. So um, what I wanted to go over here is that it is clear that uh, it will become tempting to make some compromises as a circular startup in order to succeed in a system uh, that is not the way it should be yet. Um, and we are also not aiming for a rapid exit. Um, to the contrary, we, we want an exist strategy as a company. And this is why we are uh, also looking at our governance differently. So we want uh, a steward ownership uh, model is our goal. Uh, and this basically means that uh, we have a foundation that uh, has all our uh, primary goals um, in mind and has um, a big stake in the limited liability company that makes the decisions from a more profit driven uh, Tim, I, I don't know if uh, if you want to share your presentation again. Yes, I do. I didn't know I wasn't anymore. So let me just go over and do that. Um, let's see. There we go. So, so this is just a quick overview. Um, but I hope it was also clear from my uh, little brief explanation. Um, another thing uh, worth mentioning is that we are also looking at intellectual property differently um, because uh, we want our uh, uh, our product to be innovated and shared as rapidly as possible and in uh, a uh, yeah a low capital in like a so a, a low capital way uh, a very freely distributed way and a way in which we don't have to capitalize on our on, on our um, on our ideas um, and we can really ensure this uh, that this development uh, occurs globally and uh, is also applicable globally. 
this is uh, quickly our roadmap. Um, so right now we are in a prototyping phase working towards the minimum viable product. Um, and uh, after doing uh, tests in pilot situations, uh, we want to move towards uh, certification, uh, set up a first launching customer pool and slowly move our technology readiness level um, until we are ready for large scale production in uh, 2025. Uh, the um, uh, team. Um, this is uh, uh, we we recent, since recently with Keshav as well have have a whole new team. Uh, so um, this is a this is an old slide, but the uh, the the co-founders are are still uh, the same. So um, Sai working on uh, the strategy and finance side, uh, Parim on the um, execution and networking side, and me on the product development. And Puck is doing our uh, outreach. Um, so here I have another <laughs> mentee that probably won't work. Um, you can still go to the code, fill in your answers, and um, I will uh, leave it up um, so that um, the answers can be used as food for thoughts for the Q&A. So my question is, what is the role of a startup uh, towards the industry, towards academics in developing uh, more transparent circular supply chains, uh, especially considering the fact that a startup is usually working on one part of uh, a solution and really has a focus, uh, but of course it's a systematic issue that needs systematic solution. Um, so thank you very much. And um, I would like to um, give everyone some time to uh, maybe pop in um, a few um, keywords, key terms, and then um, we can uh, have a discussion. Thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, Tim. That was uh, was very nice. I think it's um, it's excellent that you guys are, are uh, pushing this forward, and I think it's um, a very practical way of uh, addressing the issues that we're confronted with. And um, so, um, uh, yeah, I'd just like to uh, also, um, uh, of course, people are now typing stuff in the Minty meter, but also if there are any questions already, then also please raise your hand. Um, and let me just start by um, maybe kicking off. I see your hand, Florian, but uh, um, let me just kick it off with one question. Uh, uh, last week, the Critical Raw Material Act was launched and also the Zero uh, Net Zero Industries Act was launched. Both policies um, have a lot of um, interesting things for you guys, I think, in terms of uh, if you look at, um, um, well, the, the the push, let's say, for sustainable production of, of renewable energy technologies within Europe, uh, that must open opportunities for you guys in terms of funding and, um, well, stimulants uh, from, uh, from let's say, from, from governmental side. Is that something that you have noticed and also something that you, um, well, maybe already um, uh, note some impacts of, or is that something that is still far away from from your um, uh, your practical uh, uh, the practical stuff that you're doing yeah thanks uh thanks for the question i think that um uh just a, a, a disclaimer straight away i, I do think that staying uh, on a weekly basis up to date with all of all of the news in that sense is uh, is definitely a point of improvement for us but i've actually already uh, noticed it with uh, a conversation I've had with a, a, a very big glass manufacturer, AGC, uh, who um, were already speaking about um, what, a, what a huge topic this was all of a sudden uh, within the last two weeks. Um, and we hadn't heard from them in uh, a few months. Um, and they just uh, cold called us again. And they were like, hey, this, there's there's something moving. So now um, I'm going to put this forward with, with some of the partners that uh, we've yeah, felt like there's been some uh, some some um, yeah delay with um, out of lack of interest or lack of priority, uh, and this is just this is just one sign. So uh, we really have to see um, what this will bring in the future. Yeah, and and have you looked at uh, things like funding possibilities from the EIT raw materials, for example? <laughs> yeah, maybe maybe I can let Sai answer that uh, question. Yeah, hi guys, uh, I'm uh, Sai Simon. Um, I uh, used to be an industrial ecology student as well, uh, and one of the co-founders of Biosphere Solar. Uh, EIT Raw Materials um, has admitted us to an accelerator last year. Um, so we did get a funding ticket uh, from them, which was uh, uh, not equity, so basically a grant. 
which was uh, really nice. And we had quite a lot of business development in their accelerator. Uh, they were also really tough on uh, on us, uh, like saying, you know, guys, uh, uh, get your act together and um, make your customer clearer, make your value proposition clearer, uh, which was really good. It was a really good process. In the end, we have graduated from phase one of the accelerator, but they said we are still too early to move to phase two and three, which uh, involves an equity investment. Um, and uh, yeah, right now we are working on getting to the next milestones, which will hopefully enable us to get into uh, phase two and three later this year. Great, good to hear. Okay, Florian. Yes. The first, thank you very much. A very interesting idea and very necessary, definitely, in terms of circular economy. Uh, I have a question about the technology. So you decided to go for uh, silicium, and there are, of course, uh, other <clears throat> material combinations with uh, much high efficiencies, like, for example, gallium arsenide and stuff like that, of course, like that's from a criticality perspective and also from toxicity, a whole other discussion but if i imagine i um, have these circular flows i can circularize the gallium i can make sure the arsene doesn't go into an environment then i could then i have a real trade-off or because also of the higher efficiency of such modules uh, did you have a look in that or um what is your what are your ideas argumentation is there <clears throat> yeah thanks uh, thanks for the question um I think there's there's two components. I think we want a circular panel, but we also acknowledge that in order for uh, in order for us to 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 work in a supply chain that is successful in more aspects than just the materials, but also in not perpetuating a lot of the exploitative and um, uh, unethical systems that I think also uh, help us into a lot of uh, other issues down the line. Um, that's kind of the, the fairness and the transparency part. We need to look into what is in, in the solar market already a niche um, for uh, crystalline silicon. So we have already struggled uh, to find uh, European uh, partners for parts manufacturing. Uh, so looking into thin film technology and looking into uh, CIGS or organic photovoltaics are all like the third generation uh, materials out there is very interesting, but they are niches on their own. Um, and that means that we will be diving so deep into something that is still so small um, that actually the, the scalability in our phase is very limited. Um, so what we want to do is we want to, we want to simplify that for ourselves because the market is so dynamic right now for crystalline silicon. Um, and then in later versions, uh, reevaluates, hey, is, is crystalline silicon does it make sense, you know, because I can imagine, like you said, that there are that there are better processes for thin film, even just from a material perspective, because it's it's thin. <laughs> so you use a lot less material. Um, so there are a lot of advantages to that I, I definitely agree. Um, so it's, it's really just a market and timing choice more. Thank you very much. Um... I don't see any other hands raised, but I have loads of questions. Uh, so I'll just, uh, <laughs> just uh, continue. Go um, so so uh, one of the things is that, that um, um, and I'm going to quote uh, Elon Musk, although I'm, I'm aware that that might not be a good thing to do anymore, but, um, but he, he once said, well, it's very easy to design a, a, a new an electric vehicle. That's not the problem at all. The problem is to design the factory in which that car will be built uh, and to do that as efficient as possible. Is that something that, that you guys have given some thought? Yeah, maybe maybe I'll let Sai answer that question and 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 already um, uh, like like I said at the beginning, unfortunately I have to leave. But Sai and Keshav will be more than uh, happy to to answer these things. Thank you very much. Um, Thank you. And, Tim. Uh, yeah, I uh, I will hear about the discussion. Thank you very much. Yes, thanks, Rene, for the for the question. The end. Well, um, yes, we have thought about. Um, about the factory aspect of it, um, the, 
the fact of the matter is that that is the most capital intensive uh, part of, of this business. Um, in general, PV, uh, so photovoltaic economics, is all about scaling as, as big as you can uh, to, to reduce the unit costs uh, through uh, economies of scale. And um, yeah, we see that in, in China, um, for PV manufacturers, it is quite easy to unlock hundreds of millions of dollars uh, for, for gigawatt scale uh, factories, whereas here in the Netherlands, we've talked to um, producers like uh, nah, some of the, the Dutch more sustainable ones who have to, taken years to, to gather something like 15 million of investment to build a 250 megawatt plant. And uh, yeah, that shows the wariness of investors around here to to uh, to sink their money into these capital heavy um, plants. And we think that um, for us, but, it, but, but, yeah, but it's, sorry, it's, sorry. It's, I, I, I yeah? was not so much talking about the investment because I can imagine that that is an issue in itself to to find the investors, mm -hmm. but also how the design actually reflects the the producibility, let's say, on a large scale, because that is one of the reasons why Tesla still keeps on using the cylindrical uh, 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 battery cells, because it's very easy to just uh, uh, produce these, uh, these, these huge amounts of, uh, of, of lemonites that are then being put into these uh, cylindrical cells. So that was a, 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 um, yeah. let's say a, a choice that was made in terms of design in order to make it uh, relatively easy to produce on a large scale. So is that something design-wise that you have in mind? Yeah, that that is a that's a really interesting question because there has actually been a, a research from Fraunhofer in Germany um, showing that uh, an edge seal design can actually reduce the cost and the uh, complexity of production over the current design due to uh, there not being a laminator and a laminator being uh, the most energy intensive and uh, time consuming part in the uh, in the PV module manufacturing uh, uh, process. Uh, so yeah, that, that was a really, really interesting finding. And of course, the edge sealing process has been uh, fully optimized for for many years now in, in the in the insulating glass uh, industry. So uh, it's that that replacement can actually uh, increase the simplicity of the production so so i think that's a really interesting finding the way that we interconnect the cells um is is something we're working on uh, we're saying okay maybe for the minimum viable product we will just do the standard stringing um by the way also we want to outsource those processes because uh, yeah that's why i was talking about the capital we don't have it at hand so we want to use existing manufacturers and we want to be more like the designers and the people who advocate for people using uh, this circular design and not necessarily the manufacturers. Yeah, thanks. Um, and in, in terms of, of uh, let's say, um, upscaling of the technology, what are the most important challenges that you fa are facing right now in terms of design and, and, and upscaling? Um, well, the, um, besides what I've mentioned, so basically the capital, um, it is uh, experience. We're all very passionate young um, entrepreneurs, which is very good in some ways, but also uh, none of us has, has ever set up a uh, gigawatt scale factory yet. Um, so. I think getting that experience on board is something that we would really like to, but it also requires a professionalization step of, okay, we get a bigger investment. That means we can get people on board, which, um, uh, yeah, which have that, that experience. Um, I think technical challenges for, for scaling this up, I would say uh, proving that the market is there is not actually a technical challenge it's more a socio-economic challenge um, and I think it's very related to design and the way you tell your story but I mean yeah you can produce it as a, at a massive scale but if nobody wants it then uh, you uh, you're out of business very quickly um, so yeah 
building the, the product market fit. I mean, I tend to be quite optimistic about the technology. I, I don't see really um, on a technical level things that stop us from producing at a large scale. I do think what can be a limiting factor is saying, okay, we want everything to be as sustainable, as fair and as transparent as possible. Um, that, that could make us run into roadblocks where we just don't find the suppliers uh, or if we find the suppliers, it's going to be prohibitively expensive and therefore uh, not economically feasible. So that's also why I think we should not say in the beginning, okay, this thing is going to be 100% fair and 100% sustainable and transparent because then we might not even get off the ground and maybe rather we, we should say uh, we are on the way to transparency and to uh, uh, fair labor like um, Tony Chocolonely's is not slavery free chocolate. They're on the way to slavery free because when you're starting up, you just cannot guarantee that. And even if your silicon, for example, comes uh, you're like 80% of there might be mixed in. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, I think um, I think once we once we get to a little bit of a bigger scale, we can make more of an influence. Um, but at this point, I think we have to pick our battles. Okay, yeah, I, I think actually uh, I see I see your hand, Simon. But uh, uh, but just to to comment on this, uh, I think it's relatively difficult to focus, let's say, on these uh, supply chain and traceability issues. Uh, you can see how Fairphone has really struggled with these issues. So, so if if I would uh, uh, if I were, was allowed to give you some advice, I would I would say yes, of course, this is in the end your your final goal. You want to be also responsible in that sense, and I would really support that. But for the moment, I would focus on the technical details and not so much on these things, although I understand that these are important, but uh, you, 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 it's basically, um, well, it's, it's a very difficult thing to actually manage and, uh, and, and to organize. So I would, um, I would put that, let's say, forward in time in, as a next step, basically. Uh, but, uh, but Simon, you, uh, you raised your hand. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thank you very much for the webinar. It's really interesting. Uh, I'm a RSM student in Global Business and Sustainability, and I'm doing my master thesis on circular business models uh, in the solar PV industry. So uh, your company is really interesting, and I'd also love to do an interview maybe with you in the next couple of months, but I'll reach out on LinkedIn if that's fine for you. Uh, what uh, I'm interested in is, do you see any other companies in the solar industry that work towards more circularity? I know that like for solar, a very big player also does some recycling, but um, do you see any trend in the industry that also big manufacturers move towards more um, implementation of our strategies, not only recycling, but maybe also the refurbishment, reusing and repairing uh, side of it? Yeah, thanks for your question. Um, and uh, yeah, would be uh, very uh, happy to, uh, to have, a, have a chat. So uh, please reach out on LinkedIn. By the way, um, I see that my internet is slowing down quite a lot. Um, I think it's because I've moved uh, away from the router, so I'm, I think I will move again to make that a bit better. Okay. Um, but to, to answer your question, I think in, when you talk about design for um, end of life, is it, is it better now? Yes, I think it's fine now. Okay, great, great. Yeah, so when talking about design for end of life, um, there is um, initiatives that uh, increase the recyclability, for example, through using thermoplastic laminate, but um, not many that really focus on higher R levels. There has been one in France, um, which, yeah, it was a research project that was going for quite a while. Uh, maybe you're aware of it um, by a company called Apollon Solar. Um, and they have, they take a little bit of a different technical strategy than ours, but in the end, they did a lot of research, um, tried to start up their factory, it didn't work out so well. I think they didn't manage on the marketing side very well. Um, and now they're trying to restart it again. 
Um, and then there are initiatives also focusing on the reuse of solar panels. So now in the Netherlands, um, there is a company trying to implement uh, reuse of old uh, PV modules. In Germany, there's also one a marketplace for, for reusing PV modules. Um, yeah, so th those are the initiatives that I know that uh, focus on PV module uh, end of life strategies that are higher than recycling only. Cool, thank you. And are you optimistic that uh, in the next couple of years the industry will adapt even more to these circularity aspects? I mean, with the uh, high amounts of waste we expect by 2050 with the 500 uh, megatons, I mean, um, companies have to be aware of the problem and move towards um, fighting against this waste stream. So um, are you optimistic or what do you think about the big players also maybe from the Asian market? Do you see that they uh, will adapt to this problem? Yeah, um, very good question. Also very broad question because of course there's a lot of stakeholders, a lot of players. Um, I am optimistic about the European policy. Um, as uh, René also mentioned, um, there is movement. Also, right to repair, for example, is coming up more and more. And we've seen that this has also had uh, knock-on effects when it comes to Asian manufacturers. For example, restriction of hazardous materials, I think, has been quite a successful way to uh, coerce Asian manufacturers into um, yeah into compliance. And I think this is going to happen, or this could potentially also happen with uh, module manufacturing. I don't necessarily think that um, um, that they will do it out of their own interest. And I think that also economically, the interest is not really there because they there is a, a recycling contribution that is paid upon import, but it's very, very, very low, which is also understandable because you don't want to make PV modules too expensive. Um, but yeah. To be honest, I like the the incentive for the end of life value is not with the manufacturer, and there beyond that um, recycling contribution, there's no extended producer responsibility. Um, so yeah, what what we are trying to do is really show that it's possible, and thereby be trailblazers. Um, that and pioneering this design of PV modules and hopefully also influencing and uh, inspiring other manufacturers to start designing for end of life. Cool, thanks and best of luck to you. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, and I, I completely agree. I think that, that companies will not do that do this by themselves. They have to be pushed by uh, uh, legislation uh, or either a price premium that is paid by, by consumers or, or let's say uh, those that actually buy these sonar panels can also be large scale uh, companies of course that are uh, installing large scale uh, uh, solar farms uh, so so that will be the incentive and and uh, as far as i can see the the legislation as it is now coming online from from the eu if it is really accepted uh, through the parliament and the member states i think that that can really help with that because it will also push for more, let's say, European production, but it also pushes for recycling. It pushes for uh, uh, for all these things that, that you guys want, want to push. And I think it is really important that a company like yours is in, indeed showing that it is possible because it will be very easy to say, no, this is too hard or not economic or whatever. It's uh, not possible. So I think it's, it's, it's crucially important that companies like yours are, are, are pushing this. Um, so uh, if anything, even if, if the company in the end might fail or whatever, I think still it is a very useful thing that you guys are you guys are doing. So uh, so thanks for that. Um, and um, just a, a, a very practical question that I have. Um, I noted that um, um, so in my own house we have a little, uh, let's say um, uh, we have a, a a light. Uh, well, we have a couple of windows, let's say, in the roof. And it's uh, um, so it's also insulating glass. And the, the thing is that it started leaking very, very quickly. And the reason for that was that the 
outside, let's say, of the of the of the of the glass, which is normally in a window frame, was not in a window frame. It was loosely, let's say, to the, it was uh, uh, exposed to the environment. Let's say solar, wind, uh, so so sunlight, wind, and everything to the elements, basically. And it turned out that these seals were not at all suited for that. So they they since they are used, they, they need to be in the frame in order to survive, and they cannot be exposed to the to the elements. So I'm I'm just wondering how you guys solved that issue. Uh, good question. I heard that Keshov is here, and I mean I can answer that, but I mean since Keshov hasn't spoken yet, maybe it's nice for him to yeah, answer. Sure. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, that's an interesting question. Please, so, I would appreciate it if you don't work here, because it disturbs me. Thanks, Ai. Uh, so what we use is called the PIB Ed Seal, which is indeed what they use for the insulation glasses. What, mm -hmm. So we are, to be completely honest, we're still lacking long-term outdoor testing. We have a couple of installations at the Green Village at TU Delft, which are put there, I think, about half a year ago for this exact purpose to note performance specifically with penetrating humidity within the solar panels because of this edge seal. What we have done in currently is along the edge, we have the PIB edge seal, but we've also encased it in metal. So mm -hmm. to minimize direct contact with the outside elements per se. But yeah, we still have to do proper testing to measure humidity within the solar panels to see how that impacts performance. And uh, it's something that's on our radar for sure, and it's something we are, yeah, currently testing to see what's the most viable solution. Yeah, thanks. And I would like to maybe add one point related to what you said before that, Rene, which is um, that, uh, yeah, even if we fail, it would be really interesting to to um, yeah to to do this exercise and to see what is what is possible in the solar industry. And uh, what we value very highly is open sharing of ideas and of um, of, of uh, yeah the the f our findings and our research and a lot of people are telling us well wow, this is mm -hmm. this is so um, bad what you're doing you should keep everything secret uh, because uh, your competitors will uh, will immediately uh, uh, knock you out of the market as soon as you enter yeah and yeah. I mean, we're still finding our balance in that, but yeah. I think all of us agree. Um, I mean, we're scientists in the end, and we know how important it is to share your findings uh, and for other people to be able to build on your findings and those people to also share their findings so that um, you can create an open innovation ecosystem. Um, so yeah, I think uh, documenting what we do and um, yeah, sharing that with the world is is very uh, very critical also for us. Yeah, and and yeah, I I hate to do it, but but I I'm quoting Elon Musk again in in a sense that that he of course also um, uh, basically had the same strategy, right? I mean, he has uh, opened up basically all. He doesn't have any any patents in that sense, so. So the the, the all the, the the ideas about uh, both the Teslas and other things are are kind of public, uh, and and the reason for that is that he basically says, well, good luck trying to uh, to copy that. Uh, <laughs> uh, so it's 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 so there's a lot of unwritten, let's say, stuff that are that is behind, let's say, the, the patents that can still make it very difficult to uh, to copy something. I'm not sure whether that applies also to you guys, but that was what was his approach to that. So I'm um, um, uh, maybe that's something to to look into uh, at least from that perspective what he what he did there exactly and and, and how he still uh, well managed to, uh, um, um, uh, to 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 keep in front of the competition uh, ahead of the competition i should say yeah <laughs> um okay i don't see any hands raised um so for the moment i think that um um yeah i think uh, i would like to thank you guys very much for coming in here in this uh, circular industries talk and uh, presenting your work to us um, I think it's really interesting what you guys are doing. I also really appreciate the effort that you're putting into it, but I'm, because I'm pretty sure that you will have very little uh, free and spare time uh, if you're involved in, uh, in, an, in, a, in an effort like this. Uh, I think it's very valuable. I think it's very important. 
Um, yeah, and I would just like to wish you all the best. And if there's something that we can do from the Light and Delta Rosmo Center for Sustainability, let us know. Um, um, I'm not sure what in terms of, well, maybe graduations or, or student involvement or something like that. Um, uh, know where to find us and, and uh, I wish you all uh, all the best. Thank yeah. you so much. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye.